Thank you, John. Over the course of the pandemic, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has played a crucial role in reviewing and steering the authorization of vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. The circumstances have required a regulatory approach that carefully balances the need for agility during a crisis while ensuring patient safety and rigorous scientific review. Since January, Dr. Janet Woodcock has led the FDA in striking this balance as acting commissioner, and I'm thrilled and honored that she's joining us this morning. Dr. Woodcock has served in many roles at FDA since 1986. She oversaw the approval of the first biotechnology-based treatments for multiple sclerosis and cystic fibrosis, modernizing drug manufacturing and regulation, and she's advanced medical discoveries from the laboratory to consumers more efficiently and effectively. Prior to being named acting commissioner, she served as an advisor to Operation Warp Speed on the development of therapeutics during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Woodcock, it's wonderful to have you with us here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's great to be here. Well, some breaking news from the FDA this morning. The FDA has authorized COVID-19 booster shots of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for those 18 and older. Can you review for us the data that led to this decision and, and your thoughts about the, food, the importance of boosters and the future rollout of boosters for this large group of Americans? Certainly, there are two lines of evidence that we looked at. One is the evidence about waning of immunity and breakthrough infections. Some of that early data came from Israel uh, that had used uh, Pfizer's vaccine in their population. And they, were, they showed both waning humor immunity by serologic testing, as well as uh, first breakthroughs uh, in the um, older population that began to lead to hospitalization, followed by breakthroughs in younger and younger ages and uh, eventually some hospitalizations. We also had some data from the VA about this. So that line of evidence um, suggested, uh, and, and other evidence from both J&J, &J, um, Moderna and Pfizer from their trial participants um, that, they, that uh, immunity was waning and people were getting breakthrough infections. Then we, um, got serologic data on the effect of boosts uh, in people who, for example, in this case had received two doses of either the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. And the data there showed that we got a very nice uh, boost response in humoral immunity um, following that third dose. Then um, Pfizer also submitted data showing um, from their original trial, they randomized 10,000 patients, all right, um, to receive a boost or not. And they were able to show that um, they remarkably decreased the incidence of uh, primarily of symptomatic infections. There were only a few um, hospitalizations uh, in that cohort, and um, those were in the group that did not receive a boost. So, oh, and Moderna submitted the same type of uh, serologic data. So overall, we had the uh, indication of a need of waning immunity, needing to be boosted, and then uh, uh, evidence that it would be effective. Thank you very much. The way you describe that, Dr. Woodcock, it's, it's so reassuring. Uh, the scientific rigor and analytic uh, focus that you and your colleagues at FDA have always put uh, in, in the important area of drug approvals, uh, but in particular during COVID-19, the way you've, you've applied the same rigor. And it certainly should give all of us uh, who benefit from your decisions uh, reassurance of, of the rigor with which you're doing, you and your colleagues are doing that work. Thank you. And if I might add, of course, one of the concerns with these vaccines was the uh, incidence of myocarditis, which, although rare in the very in the younger age group, um, has uh, you know definitely occurs, and perhaps uh, in a rate of perhaps one in twenty thousand or so. Uh, although the myocarditis has not been severe, uh, we were able to get a fair amount of data from Israel on the Pfizer vaccine, showing that myocarditis after the third dose, which was 
are more remote in time than the second dose was much lower than the second dose. We still don't have full data on a third dose of the Moderna vaccine. And so we will have to see it is, as you know, is a half of the second dose. It is uh, the booster is a lower uh, dose. And of course, it's also um, separated in time from the first two shots. So um, we still have um, things to learn and we will be doing surveillance and have required the companies to also do surveillance to look at this side effect. Thank you. So looking back at the impact of COVID-19 on the FDA, what surprises you the most about how the FDA adapted and responded to the reality of COVID-19 and to its rapidly evolving course? Well, what was interesting uh, were, number one, the adaptation, we were able to rapidly go virtual. And I think that surprised everyone. We all get in our ruts. (laughs) But actually, I think we had to produce much more work. We estimate on the medical product centers, we had about 50% more work. Uh, than usual because of the additional needs of the pandemic, while other development programs were still ongoing, for example, cancer programs and so on. We were able to get all this work done, um, even working virtually. And it seems that for the kind of review activities, that may be a more efficient way to work. So that was surprising. As far as gaps, uh, we kind of knew this, but uh, how severe the supply chain issues would be during a pandemic and how much the FDA would be tasked with dealing with these <laughs> was very difficult. We were helping companies move around their production for their uh, marketed products to make room for these new vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, and so there were a lot of changes that had to be made at the same time. We had a chronic standing problem with small volume parenteral drugs, uh, critical care drugs. And of course, those were the ones that were urgently needed and had a huge surge uh, during the pandemic and went into shortage very rapidly. And so we've learned from that, that we really have to have better handle on supply chain, at least for these essential drugs. You mentioned going virtual uh, very quickly. Uh, FDA is a large organization, a a complex organization. As you look forward, what lasting changes do you think there will be on the way FDA monitors clinical trials on, uh, on the overall clinical trial infrastructure and the process of getting a drug from a very early stage all the way to um, uh, either emergency use authorization or or biological licensing agreement. What are the enduring changes you think that will come out of COVID-19 to those processes? Well, of course, uh, as we went virtual, we had to look at the ongoing trials. We couldn't stop a lot of the, the trials couldn't stop. They were for serious conditions. We had to figure out how to do these trials virtually. And we had to figure out how to do the COVID trials uh, to a great extent virtual. Obviously, there are people in the hospital taking care of the patient. However, informed consent became, we couldn't be handling paper around with infected patients, right? We, um, home monitoring and so forth, we could cut down on visits and do telehealth visits. I think many of these are going to endure into uh, the future. We also found we could inspect clinical trials virtually uh, and do virtual assessments as well as manufacturing facilities. We had uh, workers in these fields um, have um, uh, mounted cameras and go around and (laughs) inspect the documents virtually and so forth. And I think all these things, as you know, we had been pushing for more statistical monitoring versus physical monitoring of clinical trials because we feel it is more effective. And this actually moved that along, I think. And as I said, sort of like um, showing up at the office, uh, we were forced to do things differently. We realized many of the practices were probably superior and we'll probably be sticking with those in the future. Historically, the FDA's interactions have mainly been with physicians, healthcare organizations, uh, clinical trial organizations, industry. But during the pandemic, the FDA has had a much more front and center role with the general public and certainly with with the press. And I was wondering if you could reflect on that. And once the pandemic is behind us, do you think 
will some of these changes and some of the, the public facing role of the FDA endure? And, and how has your role at the FDA evolved? Uh, certainly you've been the acting commissioner uh, during, during much of the very important advances coming out of the FDA during COVID-19. And how have you seen your role evolve uh, during the pandemic? Well, as far as the role of the FDA, you know, over the decades I've been at the agency, we've become more and more and more in the spotlight every day. Right now, you don't can't really look at the media and, you know, and pull up a screen on any major media without finding some kind of discussion about FDA, whether it be foods or uh, genetically modified animals or, <clears throat> you know, um, medical products and so forth. So I think that will be ongoing and we have a much um, higher profile in all the policy discussions going forward. And there are upsides to that, but there are downsides to that as well. We have to make sure it's not distracting. My role, frankly, is to, has been to lead. It's what I've done for a long time. And so stepping into this role has been okay. We have all these things we have to get done. We had many other issues um, in addition to COVID and we had to get them done and we took them one at a time and we, we uh, crossed that, climbed that mountain and got over it. And uh, so we are still in the crisis mode, I would say at the FDA. Um, we've had like 600 EUAs for di diagnostic devices or other devices. We've had vac all the vaccines, we've had multiple therapeutics and plus we're, we've done a major effort on vaping um, this year and getting vaping products under regulatory um, purview. And, you know, and we've also done a major push on nutrition. For example, we issued guidance on lowering sodium in foods. Uh, and I think that'll be a landmark uh, health uh, activity. So um, yeah, it, and that's how the FDA is. There's always uh, all these things that must get done. Certainly a bright spot during COVID-19 was the rapid development and deployment of vaccines, safe and highly effective vaccines. But therapeutics have not emerged as quickly and and there are, of course, lots of reasons for that, but I was wondering if you could discuss that and compare and contrast the vaccine development and rollout with the therapeutic rollout. And of course, some encouraging news on therapeutics that, that perhaps you can describe to us as well. Sure. Well, you know, the vaccines um, have a mechanistic sort of understanding, right, of how we do, of what vaccine, vaccination is, of how it can work, of, and those platforms, the mRNA platform and some of the older platforms, the subunit vaccines, the adenovirus vectors had been used before. So decades of work had gone into making those platforms available. And so uh, scientists were rapidly able to adapt them and put in the spike protein, which was had rapidly been identified as one of the major uh, antigenic targets and so forth. And so the, and then really billions of dollars were put into getting those clinical development programs done in unprecedented way. For therapeutics, it's more difficult. You know, the small molecule antivirals that we're talking about even now are have been repurposed. Um, it takes a long time to develop a small molecule antiviral, particularly respiratory viruses. We have not been that successful, as you know, in getting antiviral products. I was the therapeutic lead for Operation Warp Speed, as you said, and um, I focused on monoclonal antibodies because they're um, they were easy to develop. Again, it was a platform that was uh, pretty easy to, to get going. And um, there was a lot of mechanistic plausibility, again, for um, passive immunity. And so that wasn't the only thing that was focused on, but that was kind of something that had a high probability of success. To everyone's surprise, they don't work well in the inpatient setting. All right. And that apparently is because uh, you've gone beyond having a viral illness and you're having an immune dysregulation. That's very problematic. I think um, the later stages of uh, the disease look a lot, not exactly, but like ARDS of different kinds. And, you know, we've been working for decades on trying to find effective treatments in that setting uh, with 
very little success. So the fact that we have um, uh, dexamethasone and other um, interventions that can somewhat mitigate that phase is very good. But I think our main focus still needs to be keep people out of the hospital, if at all, keep them from progressing to these severe stages, which are very difficult to treat. We do have, it's been publicly announced that both Pfizer and Merck have small molecule antivirals. Uh, one is a polymerase inhibitor, one's protease inhibitor. At the end of this month, we're having a public advisory committee on the Merck drug to discuss some of the issues. And um, they have uh, both publicly announced they're submitting, have submitted EUAs, emergency use authorization requests to the agency. And um, there's some other monoclonals that are under review. So I think we may have more tools in our toolbox, uh, one would hope, if these are successful um, fairly soon, that should help uh, slow that progression, because these are all um, to be used in an outpatient setting. The inpatient setting, again, has proved somewhat intractable once people get into this later phase of disease. So... Um, but um, it's spectacular how rapidly we actually have developed uh, interventions that are successful, as well as vaccines. It's really unprecedented and a tribute to all the, the science that has gone into it. Looking back over your long and very distinguished and accomplished career at the FDA, what are you most proud of? I'm proud of building an organization that could really uh, respond to all the needs uh, going forward, which are many and varied and changeable. Um, the Center for Drugs was able to step up and deal with the demands of the pandemic, the supply chain issues. We, <laughs> we even had to deal, get the distilleries to make hand sanitizer and so forth. We were able to do all these activities and it was because we have a very strong organization with very strong science and, and good processes. And um, we were able to rise to that challenge. And, you know, I hope that um, in my time as uh, acting commissioner, I'm trying to continue the build of a strong organization that can respond. Well, Dr. Woodcock, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and Dr. Woodcock, I have to say on behalf of all of us, thank you for your extraordinary leadership you have brought wisdom and poise and clarity to every role that you've had at the FDA. And, and on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for what you are doing. And we wish you the very best. Thank you so much.